Buffy the Vampire Slayer here, but it's probably a little too too late for that kind of joke. It's been a long time since that show's been on the, on the air. The rest of it is Red Blood Cells. Or, technically, they're not cells. So, red blood corpuscles. They're not technically cells because they don't have nuclei. At least in humans, they, in mammals, they don't. In some other species, they do have nuclei. But in mammalian species, they do not. So, whether you call them red blood cells or red blood corpuscles, we channel just approaches to RBCs just to keep things simple. Okay. And that's usually about 44% of the content of your blood. This would be the hematocrit. So the first thing pathologists would do with your blood sample is really take a look at the hematocrit. Okay? Because this number doesn't really vary that much. If it does, it could be a sign of something going on. Something's not quite right. Okay. If your hematocrit is lower than 44%, I'm going to talk about significantly lower, not 43.5. Okay. Um, but pretty significantly lower, something's wrong. You're not producing enough red blood cells. Okay. If your hematocrit is significantly higher than 44, again, something's wrong. You're producing too many. So, that's what's basically on this slide. Again, it's divided mostly into plasma, about 40-55%. What's in plasma? Well, it's mostly water. Right? So about 90% of plasma is going to be water. About 8% is going to be protein. A major protein there would be albumin. That protein is there to help maintain the osmotic pressure inside the blood vessels so that blood vessels will tend to hold on to water, so that your blood actually contains water. Otherwise, water will just imply most of the areas of high solid concentrations, i.e. your tissues. So you want to have something, something in there, like albumin, to help maintain the amount of water inside the vessels. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the lymphatic system next week. Globulins, some of the globulins are immunoglobulins, okay, so those will be the antibodies. Okay. Uh, fibrinogen is the main protein that is involved in clotting, it becomes fibrin. So fibrinogen is the inactive form, and when it is cleaved, it is activated, and it produces fibrin, which is one of the main components, main fibrous components of a blood clot. Okay. So during clotting, this stuff becomes converted into an actual blood clot. So there's a lot of clotting factors and anti-clotting factors in your bloodstream right now, and they are in a very delicate balance. When things start to go out of balance, you either have a problem with clotting or a problem with not amount clotting. Okay, so, uh, but they are generally very well maintained and very delicate balance. And then about two percent or so is nutrients, blood gas, blood gases, hormones, electrolytes. Um, all kinds of different things that would be known as suspended within that water. The remaining 45% is the formed elements of blood. And those formed elements of blood are mostly cells. So the main component there is going to be the erythrocyte, or the red blood corpuscle, or red blood cell, or RBC. And then a very small component of that is going to be white blood cells, or leukocytes. Now, leukocytes, when they were initially uh, being observed by microscopists, uh, were subdivided into two general categories. Microscopists noticed that after staining with a white stain or a protein cell stain, uh, they noticed that these white blood cells either had granules on their cytoplasm, they looked granular, or they didn't. 
And so, so they subdivided the white blood cells into granulocytes and agranulocytes. So that's the initial uh, division that we have here. Now, as we look at them a little bit more closely, we notice that some granules are a little different than others. They stain differently than others, and so we started naming them based on the characteristics of the staining of those granules. And so, in granulocytes, we have cells called neutrophils, which basically have granules that stain with these neutral azure dyes. Uh, we had cells called eosinophils, which, which had granules that stained with eosin. And we had basophils, because hematoxin, hematoxinophils is a bit of a mouthful, so we kept it simple. So basophils obviously will take on basic down. Now, under agranulocytes, we have cells called monocytes and lymphocytes. Now, lymphocytes are the cells that most of us think of when we think of white blood cells. But in fact, in your bloodstream, uh, so in the bloodstream uh, lymphocytes are not the main white blood cell. They are in lymphatic tissues, but not in the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, neutrophils are the most common white blood cell. And again, remember, all of these together make up about 1% of the cells that you will be seeing on your slides. So when you look at your slides this week, when you look at your blood smears, you'll be seeing lots of red blood cells. Lots of red, 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 red everywhere. And then periodically you might notice a nucleus. A nucleus belongs to white blood cell. And so you'll want to take a little closer look at that white blood cell to figure out which of these it is, which of these categories it belongs to. And again, the last component of that formed elements of blood, quote unquote, is the platelet. And again, platelet is not a cell, it's actually a fragment of the cell. And so again, this is why the category is generally known as the formed elements of blood, and not just blood cells. So let's talk about each one before we do. So, erythrocytes and all these cells together make up about 45% of the contents of your blood. Okay. Of that, about 44%, maybe a little bit more than that, are erythrocytes. Less than 1% is leukocytes. Okay. So if we just look at this, just the blood cells on their own, erythrocytes make up probably about 98, 99% of all cells in the bloodstream. White blood cells make up about 1% of the cells in the bloodstream. Okay, so let's take a look at erythrocytes. So as I mentioned earlier, they make up roughly 43 to 44% of the hematocrit. Okay? And that's under normal conditions. Again, if it's an abnormal situation, um, you'd be dealing with maybe a significantly lower amount or a significantly higher amount. And those two differences could mean two very different things that are going on inside the patient's body. So, the function is to transport oxygen to uh, tissues and cells. Well, to tissues really. They give up the oxygen um, in various areas, and then oxygen just diffuses across to the cells that require it. Um, now, basically, the way that happens is that erythrocytes have an oxygen carrying protein called hemoglobin. So it is that hemoglobin that actually carries the oxygen for them. Um, because they are filled with hemoglobin, they, they tend to stain very eosinophilic. So they tend to be very red on your slides. Now, erythrocytes are produced in the bone marrow. Um, lucky for you, we're not going to go because there's many different stages and many different cell types to recognize there. Absolutely no idea how the prof that I took this course with managed to get through all this stuff and still managed to teach us um, blood development all in one lecture. I have no idea how he did this because I'm going to struggle to finish this lecture today. So, uh, but just be happy you don't have to learn hemophoiesis because that is, well, at least not in this course. If you take animal development, you might have to. So, uh, but in this course, you won't have to. Hemophoiesis, that's a lot of different cell types to learn from every one of those cells that we're going to be talking about today. But anyway, um, erythrocytes are produced 
um, and the bone marrow, and their production is controlled by the hormone erythropoietin. Now, you might have heard of this hormone, uh, something also referred to as EPO. How many of you have heard of EPO or erythropoietin? In what context have you heard about this? Blood doping. Blood doping, yes. Okay. So let's say you are going to try to compete in the Tour de France. Um, you are going to be needing a lot of oxygen to be delivered to your muscles. How do you get more oxygen to your muscles? More blood, very good. Okay. And so what do people do? They will want to make more blood. Okay. One way to do that is to inject erythropoietin. You have more erythropoietin, that's more of this hormone that stimulates the production of red blood cells, therefore more red blood cells are being produced. Therefore you have greater oxygen carrying capacity um, so you can compete better in your race. I'm not telling you how to cheat. I don't want you to do that. And here's the reason why. More red blood cells means more viscous blood. How do you think that's going to affect your vascular system? Pressure, more resistance, really, more resistance. Okay, it's going to be more difficult. Try squeezing, try pushing honey through a tube as opposed to water. Okay? The more viscous something is, the more difficult it is to push it through a tube. Okay? And your heart will be trying very hard to do this anyway, because it needs to deliver all that blood to all those muscles. So your heart will be pumping a lot faster. You are going to be hurting your cardiac muscle. And two, as your cardiac muscle is pumping really hard and generating a lot of pressure in those blood vessels, the more you've got more vascular resistance means you're more likely to damage your endothelium. And we talked a little bit about what damage endothelium tends to result in. You're going to have clots forming on the surfaces of blood vessels, they can start breaking off, start clogging up smaller blood vessels further down the line, okay, and causing more serious damage later on. So, uh, it's not just about the fact that you're not being fair to the other athletes. It's also the fa fact that you are really potentially hurting yourself. Okay? It could have some serious health consequences later down the line. Now, how does um, Lance Armstrong keep winning all those races? It's not EPO. They've tested many times, I'm sure. He has an abnormally large heart. So he has a huge amount of cardiac muscle that is able to deliver or pump that blood um, much more efficiently than mine or maybe yours. Okay? So uh, that's how he keeps on winning. He has a normally he's a freak of nature, basically. And he has a normally large heart. Um, so apparently no EPOs in his system. So uh, he's not cheating, he's just different, that's all. Okay, so again, this under normal conditions, it's going to be there to help you replenish your blood stores. Again, it can be abused to help make you more blood, but again, that is going to cause you more issues as well. Now, speaking of more viscous blood and increasing oxygen carrying capacity, um, a few years back, FIFA, the world governing body of soccer, has basically decreed that um, there's going to be an upper limit for the altitude at which it will be able to hold World Cup events. So countries like Bolivia or Peru will never ever host um, a World Cup event. And that's because they are just too high up. Okay? Now, the problem there is that if you have athletes from all over the world coming down to this one region, the athletes who are acclimated to work and, and play in that environment are going to be able to compete very well. Because at high altitudes, um, you might have lower oxygen amounts in the atmosphere, but they have a blood, the bloodstream that is capable of, or is adapted to deal with this. So that they can increase their oxygen carrying capacity by increasing the amount of blood they have. Whereas other athletes coming into the area, uh, they're going to have to acclimate themselves to the environment. So they're going to have to get used to breathing thin air. They have less oxygen, which means that their bodies will have to make more 
red blood cells by, again, activating this. Again, the issue is they either don't wait long enough and they play on, you know, using bodies that are acclimated to work at lower altitudes and they get tired very easily. Or they train up in those higher altitudes and they compete like the other players. But again, their hearts have not been adapted to work with the viscosity of blood that they would then have. That's not to say that people who live at high altitudes don't have more viscous blood, they do. But their heart and their vascular system is already adapted to deal with this because they've been living at that altitude for much of their lives. So if you're a Bolivian, you've probably been living pretty high up in, in the mountains. So your heart is already adapted, your blood vessels are adapted to deal with the amount of pressure that it has to. Whereas someone who isn't, who hasn't been living there for very long, is going to have a hard time. And so they could have serious health issues. And if you know anything about professional athletes these days, in soccer or otherwise, you know they cost clubs a lot of money. So these guys are not going to go and potentially risk health problems and then not being able to play for their teams um, in other competitions. So this is why you're never going to see uh, World Cup events at high altitudes because of, again, this problem. When you have too many cells, this is called erythrocytosis. Okay. So basically, that refers to having more red blood cells than you're supposed to. Okay. So again, that would show up in your hematocrit as well. That would increase your hematocrit above the 44%. And by the way, if something ends with cytosis, it probably <coughs> refers to an increase in number. So if you're seeing any kind of uh, medical stuff where you're looking at journals and they're talking about something like leukocytosis, it means increase in number of white blood cells. If it ends in philia, again, it's an increase in number. If it ends in penia, it's a decrease in number. So, for example, if we have eosinophilia, that could mean two different things as far as histologists are concerned. Either something that likes being stained with eosin, or if you're looking at eosinophils, it means that you have an increased number of eosinophils. If you have an eosinopenia, or let's say neutropenia, it means you have a decreased number of those cells, so an increased number of neutrophils. So keep those in mind when you're looking at literature. It will help you to understand what's going on when you do better. Okay, now increasing production, okay, more hydropoietin, or go and bike at high altitudes and you have more oxygen carrying capacity. What about lowered oxygen carrying capacity? That can also happen. So those are often referred to as anemias. Okay? It means they have less ability to carry oxygen fewer red blood cells in many cases. Okay. One of the reasons for that could be that you could have damage to some of the cellular skeleton of the erythrocyte. The erythrocytes have a very specific shape to them. They are a biconcave disc. That shape is controlled by the cellular skeleton of that cell. And these molecules, actin, spectrum, and anchorin, are very much involved in maintaining that shape. If there's a mutation to one of these genes that causes it to not work properly, you could end up having a problem with the cytoskeleton and therefore uh, a problem with the shape of the cell. Now, if our red blood cell doesn't have the right shape to it, it will then be preferentially removed from the bloodstream, in places like the liver or the spleen. We'll talk about the spleen next week, and so you'll see how that is one of these organs where red blood cells go to die. And that's where they are removed from the system. 
So you could have something called a crenated cell, which a crenated cell looks kind of like a kind of very lumpy looking cell. So instead of looking fairly round, it just has this kind of a lumpy appearance. Or you could have a spherocyte, which is just basically a spherical cell. Okay? So it doesn't have that biconcave disc shape. Okay? If a red blood cell doesn't have the normal shape, doesn't really have the flexibility that is required of it. And so it will be removed from the system. Oh, and that's one other thing I want to mention. Um, one of the ways to detect whether someone has had a recent release of extra red blood cells from the bloodstream, uh, from their from their bone marrow, is to look at a slime. Because if you have just recently released a lot of red blood cells, you're going to have a lot of cells called reticulocytes. And a reticulocyte is basically the last stage of development of a red blood cell. So red blood cells, when they are released from the bone marrow, they don't always come out completely mature. They will quite often actually be released slightly immature. Um, so instead of having this nice round sort of body concave disc sort of shape, just drawing the thicker part, or coloring the thicker part of the cell in, they will have, again, still relatively eosinophilic sort of boundaries. But one of the things to look for with reticular cells is the presence of a little bit of basophilic stippling, a little bit of basophilic staining periodically is still showing up. Okay. So Basically, those are the remnants of the ribosomes that are still present within these cells. Again, you have to remember that in order to make all this hemoglobin, these cells had to have lots of ribosomes initially. Ribosomes are basophilic. As these cells mature, as they become filled in with hemoglobin, they remove all of their organelles and all the unnecessary stuff, including the nucleus, and also including the ribosomes. So by the time the cells mature, its only function is to carry oxygen. And so it's only going to need to be filled with, um, again, we're simplifying it, but it's only going to need to be filled with hemoglobin. And so it doesn't require a lot of ribosomes. These cells have a very finite lifespan. So once they are done, uh, they live for 120 days, and once they are done, they are done. They are removed from the system. So they don't require anything else. They simply require enough in their cytoplasm to be able to continue doing what they're doing. And that means lots of hemoglobin and not much else beyond that. Okay. So anything else that is not required by these cells is going to be removed. Okay. And so reticulocytes will still have a little bit of the remnants of those uh, ribosomes still present in the cytoplasm. So you might see a little bit of basically stain. And that would be a reticulocyte. If you're seeing a lot of reticulocytes, so I think a normal number for reticulocytes is about 1%. Let me see if I can write that anywhere. No, of course I didn't write it down. So, but it's roughly about 1% of your red blood cells will be reticulocytes. If what you're seeing on a slide is a lot more, that means that the individual that this blood sample was taken from probably had a recent release of red blood cells from the bone marrow. Why would that be? Well, they were either bleeding very severely recently, or they had a shot of EPO bleeding recently. That's not the way to test for that. Very quick blood test. Okay, so we have cell 
that in its mature form it is a nucleus, it does not have a nucleus. Now if it doesn't have a nucleus, then it is not mitotic. It can't divide if you don't have a nucleus. Okay. And so basically this cell is going to circulate, perform its function, and then it dies. It doesn't make more copies of itself. You want more red blood cells? You need to go to the bone marrow where the stem cells are that will generate more red blood cells. Okay. So after about 120 days or so, these cells are going to be removed from the bloodstream. Usually that's going to happen in the spleen or in the liver. Now the actual shape is a biconcave disc. So if we were to take a look at it from the side, which we all are familiar, fairly familiar with red blood cells, if we were to take a look at it from the side, it kind of looks like this. And again, from the top, you kind of have this thicker region that is more intensely stained because there's more, hemato uh, sorry, more hemoglobin between you and the light source under the microscope. Whereas the central region, this is called the central area of power region. Of power. The fact that it's more pale. Central area of power. That is a little more pale because, again, it's thinner has less hemoglobin in that area, and therefore more light passes through that sample or through that part of the cell to reach your eye. And so it looks more clear because of that. Now, this area of pallor actually has a fairly defined size in a normal red blood cell. If you have a red blood cell that, I'm really drawing it to scale, both the same size, but this thicker area is smaller, it seems smaller, and you have a much larger central area of power, that indicates something to you. Why would a cell that's shaped the same way have a lighter staining region here and a much uh, more pale center, or a much larger, much wider central pale area? Spherical? Sorry? It's spherical. It's spherical? No, if it was spherical, you'd actually have the central region being more intensely stained. So if it was a spherocyte, this area here would be the one that contains the most hemoglobin. It's got the widest area between you and the light source. Okay? So this is still a fairly normal shape. But why would it be less intensely stained? What are some obvious things you might think of immediately? It's staining less, therefore? Less Sorry? Less Very good. Less hemoglobin. Less hemoglobin. So if you're seeing, if you're seeing a cell that has a larger than normal area, central area of power, it could be an indication of anemia. At least one, one type of anemia. You're not making enough hemoglobin. Why do you think you might not make enough hemoglobin? Sorry? Iron. Thank you. Not enough iron. You don't have enough iron, you can't make enough hemoglobin. So you might have cells that look like this. Okay? That's one of the reasons you might see something like this. Okay? Um, what about?
if you're looking at a section, because you had to go through fixation and all those other steps, cells tend to shrink. And because of that, in a section, we tend to see something a little bit closer, about 6.5 to 7 micrometers, not meters. Micrometers in diameter. So depending on the type of slide you're looking at, if it's a section or if it's a smear, it's a blood smear. If it's a blood smear, a typical red blood cell is about 7 to 8 micrometers in diameter. If you're looking at a, a suction tissue, then a red blood cell probably would be a little bit closer to this, about 6.5 to 7 micrometers in diameter. So not a huge difference, but again, there's a little bit of shrinkage, you've got to remember that. Now, this is a very consistent number, which is why red blood cells can be referred to as the microscopist's ruler. Because if you have a red blood cell somewhere on your slide, you can measure anything you want. You can figure out the sizes of everything else on your slide as long as you have that red blood cell there. Okay? So it's a very consistent thing. So what's going on if you have a cell that looks more like this? And again, let's say that the shape is still normal. Staining is still relatively normal. It's just bigger. This is referred to as a macrocyte. So why would your body make macrocytes? Remember, your body is very, very logical. There's reasons for why it does things. If it does something abnormal, there's a reason for it. Normally, it wants to make these. Obviously, if it's making these, it can't make these. Why would this be? What's going on? What is your body, what is your body responding to if you have macrocytes? It needs to deliver more. It needs to deliver more. But why not just make more red blood cells? So it's a good guess. It needs to deliver more oxygen. So you're kind of on the right track. But then why don't you just make more red blood cells? Yeah? Is it compensating for other red blood cells? Okay, well, there's, again, there's a reason why it has to make larger cells. Okay? So you're kind of getting on the right track in terms of it needs to bring in more oxygen to the tissues. But why can't it do that by just increasing the number of red blood cells? You know, you have erythropoietin. You can do that with erythropoietin. So why not just generate more red blood cells? Yeah. Maybe the specific space inside the vessel is better accommodated with a larger amount of oxygen. So you're saying just because you got larger blood vessels, you can make larger cells? Because they can line up more easily instead of clogging the blood cells. Okay. What's the smallest capillary we have? What's the smallest diameter that we talked about last, last time? The smallest one. <coughs> you can look at your notes. It's okay. It's not a test. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a good idea, but it's not quite there. Okay, so what's the smallest capillary diameter? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What is it? What do you got? Yeah. You don't, you don't write it. Okay, about four micrometers. Hmm. Four micrometers. Diameter of a capillary. What's the diameter of a blood cells again? Seven to eight. So one of the reasons that we have a biconcave disc is we can squeeze through those small capillaries. So larger blood vessels are not the issue here. What else? If you're lacking iron, so say you're anemic, you can't provide the nutrients to make more red blood cells that you still need to deliver. Okay. So you're thinking iron deficiency is the problem. But if you have larger cells, you need to add more hemoglobin into them. So hold on to that thought. It will be useful later. Okay. Yes. Hormone deficiency. Hormone deficiency. Okay, so we don't have enough erythropoietin, and therefore we're not making enough red blood cells. We're getting closer. Okay. She's on the right track. Now let's study a hormone deficiency. What else could it be? Lactobacillus. Good. Your bone marrow is not making enough cells. Okay. One of the reasons for that could be vitamin B12 deficiency. The vitamin B12 is very important for mitosis. Folic acid deficiency. Folate. These are things that are important for mitosis, for DNA synthesis. 
if you can't make cells very easily because you're lacking these basic components, you're going to try to pack as much punch into every cell as possible. So you'll make bigger cells so they can carry more oxygen, even though you're making fewer cells. So you see the, the logic that your body has. It's still trying to deliver this amount of oxygen using fewer cells. So how do you do this? Make more cells or make bigger cells. Okay? So how about, and so this is again, this is a macrocyte. Uh, this is usually what we call macrocyte if it's greater than 9 micrometers. Okay? So let's say we have a smaller cell. This one would be less than about 6 micrometers. Okay, this would be a microcyte. Okay, so why would we have your bone marrow producing smaller cells? Sorry? They're producing too much, so they're slowing down. Mm -hmm. Why not just make fewer? That's a possibility too. You don't have to keep on churning out more red blood cells if you don't need them. Yeah. Iron deficiency. If you can't make enough hemoglobin, you gotta put in as much as you can to each individual cell, but they don't need to be as big as you would otherwise make them. Okay? So iron deficiency. Is a question back there, Chris? Oh no. Okay. Okay, so let's move on from there because we don't want to take too much time on this. Okay, so back to this. So again, the acidophilic staining of the cells is due to the hemoglobin content within the cell. And the actual concentration of hemoglobin inside a typical red blood cell is about a 33% solution. And those of you who have taken HUIB12 or BioB12 will know what 33% solution means. It's weight by volume, for example. 33 grams per 100 milliliters. Okay? So it's a 33% solution of hemoglobin. Okay, so that's red blood cells. So let's move on to the white blood cells. Hopefully I can get through them quickly enough to actually talk about one more fun stuff that we have. Okay, so let's talk about neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most common white blood cells in your bloodstream. Not in your body, but in your bloodstream. These are the cells that are the first ones to arrive at the site of inflammation, the site of infection. Uh, they are your first responders. Now, I'm not saying, you know, they're the first ones to see uh, a pathogen, but they will be the first ones that arrive once they are called for. Okay, so once your macrophage involves a bacterium, and it sends out an SOS signal saying, we've got an infection, we need help over here. First set of cell inside of infection is going to be a neutrophil. Okay? And that's because they are the most common ones in the bloodstream. So there are lots of them in the bloodstream. Chances are there's going to be at least a few close by to wherever it is that infection is occurring. Now, these cells have roughly a 12 to 15 micrometer diameter. Again, that's a relatively consistent number. Okay. And they have a very, very um, characteristic appearance. Um, they are highly phagocytic and very, very specialized for their function. Okay. So they are going to be filled with granules. Some of them are going to be lysosomes. They're actually going to be very large lysosomes. Okay. So the granules you'll be seeing, especially one of the kind of stainless azurophilic dyes, neutral dye, kind of slightly pinkish purple color to them. Um, those are mostly lysosomes. Okay? They're very large lysosomes. There's other types of granules within these cells. I don't want to go into the details and make you memorize a whole bunch of components within these granules. There's not much point to doing that at this point. Um, just suffice it to say that one of the major granules there is going to be the lysosome. Okay? Yeah? Um, the, 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 the Yeah, so they don't really care what they're involved in. As long as it's foreign, they will break it down. Or at least they will attempt. So they like, will take in RBCs? Um, these ones don't tend to take RBCs. They will tend to take in foreign particles. Okay. 
so they will try to take up any bacteria, especially bacteria they're very good against. Um, but again, any kind of foreign antigens they will react to, they will try to break it all down and destroy it. Basically, they are the search and destroy team of the body. They will try to find whatever doesn't belong and kill it. Okay? They are specialized for that. Um, now, these are single-use cells, so they have a one-week lifespan. Okay? So if you don't use it, you lose it. But there's going to be plenty more being produced by your bone marrow. In fact, your bone marrow has within it uh, a store of neutrophils, immature neutrophils, that it can be used at any time, that can help resupply your bloodstream whenever you use up a lot of these things. Okay? Uh, now, once they have performed their job, basically they destroy whatever it is that they are trying to destroy, they die. Uh, the remnants of that is referred to as pus. Right? So if you ever have something on your hand or on your arm or something on your body that kind of just bursts and you've got this white milky stuff blowing out of it, just another part of that at least is dead neutrophils. Okay? So they have these granules again. Uh, the major ones that you can actually see are going to be most of the lysosomes. Uh, they also have very characteristic looking nucleus. Okay? If we were to try to draw one of these things, what we have is for the cell boundaries. We might have just barely visible granules. And you have a nucleus that is multi lobed So it's not multiple nuclei, it's actually a single nucleus that is divided up into lobules. And they're all interconnected with one another by a little bit of chromatin. Okay. And basically, these cells have produced what they need to produce. So all of their liberative enzymes, all of their organelles, they have produced those. Once they have done this, when they are, once they are mature enough, they don't need any more of their chromatin because they're going to be just there to do their job and then die. Right? So these cells will basically sequester away and package away all their chromatin with these tiny little um, spaces within the nucleus. They just break up that nucleus into these very tiny um, globs. Okay? Now there's a very good reason for this. These cells need to be able to squeeze through very tiny openings in the blood vessel walls that they will open up. So they need to be able to squeeze through that. And again, uh, we will see, hopefully, uh, at the end of this lecture, an example of one of these cells squishing through. They need to be very flexible. They need to be able to squeeze through very tiny spaces. And so having this very uh, lobulated nucleus allows them to fit into very tiny spaces to begin with. Okay? Now, the lobules give you some idea of how old these neutrophils are. A neutrophil that looks like this this is the nucleus right here and again you can draw in the granules the granules present is an immature neutrophil so fairly, it's a fairly young uh, This is sometimes referred to as a band cell, or as having a band nucleus. And this is the type of a neutrophil that is commonly released from the bone marrow. And then as it you know, lives a little longer in the bloodstream, it lobulates and packages away its chromatin a little bit more and becomes this, the mature form. Now, as this neutrophil ages, if it doesn't get used and it becomes older, we end up with a cell that has a hypersegmented nucleus. So it just keeps on packaging away its chromatin into more and more lobules until you get a very large number of them, and this has a hyper segmented nucleus. The granules are still there. So, 
you get some idea of the age just by looking at them. So this is age. The older they get, the more lobular the nucleus is. So a normal neutrophil would have between three to four, maybe five lobules. Okay? So this would be what you would normally expect to see, about three to five lobules or so. Once they start to get very lobulated, if you're looking at eight or nine lobules, it's telling you that you're looking at a very old neutrophil. Why am I bringing this up? Because you can see them. Oh, and by the way, um, neutrophils are sometimes referred to as PMNs, which stands for polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Am I going to spell it for you? I'm not going to use that term. But you will sometimes see PMN showing up in literature. It's very commonly used in medical literature as PMNs or polys. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, just going to stick with neutrophil just to keep things simple. Okay. Polymorphonuclear leukocytes. It's the same thing as neutrophil. It just means neutrophil. Radical. 
Now, radicals are very, very dangerous because they tend to damage membranes. Okay? Now, all this stuff is happening within the phagosome. Okay? The cell, the, ne the neutrophil, takes up a pathogen, it fuses the physosomes with that uh, phagosome, and basically starts this whole process, this respiratory burst. So it's all contained. And so you have these reactive oxygen species being released within this compartment that will tend to damage the membranes of whatever bacterium it has involved. And so it kills the bacterium in the just basically damaging the membrane of that cell. Now sometimes these, these radicals will get released into the surrounding tissue. Sometimes a neutrophil may not be able to engulf something completely. And some, when it does, if it can't do that, this is referred to as... Press, I can't see that. Frustrated phagocytosis. Basically, here is your here is your pathogen or whatever foreign body, and here is your neutrophil trying to engulf it. Let's <laughs> get its characteristic nucleus. Here's your neutrophil trying to engulf. It's not going to happen. Okay? But it's going to try, and it's going to try to fuse the lysosome with that. And it's going to release reactive oxygen species towards this pathogen, but also throughout the surrounding tissue as well. And so this is how we get some tissue damage in areas of inflammation. Okay. This will become important later on. Okay, so, what do we know? It produces reactive oxygen species, that means it requires some energy. That energy is initially stored in the form of glycogen. In fact, um, these cells mostly rely on glycogen. They don't really re rely on the mitochondria very much. They have very few mitochondria of any. And so, basically, once that energy store is used up, the cells die. Okay. But this right here, also makes them excellent at getting into areas that are hypoxic, into areas where there is no oxygen. Okay. Areas, for example, where you have a fairly large bacterial infection, those bacteria have taken up all the oxygen, and they have basically made a fairly um, environment that is very oxygen poor. That oxygen poor environment would make most of your cells in your body um, very, very ill. It would make, them very make it very difficult for them to function normally. But neutrophils are perfectly adapted to deal with these sorts of conditions. Okay? So anaerobic conditions are not a problem for neutrophils because they rely on glycolysis for energy. So they don't require oxygen to be present. So they can, get, they can go into these areas and perform their job. Okay? Just make sure I haven't missed anything. Since we were talking earlier about problems with red blood cells on a slide, what if you have a slide that has a lot of leaves? What do you think that might indicate? Remember, these things get used whenever there is a pathogen present. So, what could indicate if you have lots of band nuclei on the slide? Sorry? Infection, good, right? So if you have an infection, a lot of your normal, mature neutrophils will get used up. And so your bone marrow will have to release fresh ones. And so you're going to have a slide that contains a lot of these band nucleated or band cells. And so this would be referred to as a left shift. So if a majority of your neutrophils that you're seeing on a slide are of this variety, you're probably looking at a left shift. And that indicates that there's been a recent use of the normal, mature neutrophils, and so new ones have had to be released 
vascular from the uh, bone marrow. What about if you're seeing this? If you're seeing a slide that has lots of these very highly mature, very, very old neutrophils, what could that be an indication? This is called a right shift, by the way. Sorry? A healthy individual? Uh, a healthy individual or unhealthy? Healthy. Healthy? Well, healthy would be this. This is healthy. Right, so if we're looking at lots of neutrophils that are very full, that's something else. Yeah? Problems producing new Problems producing new neutrophils. Okay, so again, a bone marrow issue. What are we seeing with red blood cells that could be a bone marrow issue? Efficiency. Again, if it affects red blood cell production, it's going to affect all kinds of other cells as well. Okay. So if we're seeing a right shift, it indicates that we have an issue producing more neutrophils. So all you've got left in the bloodstream are the ones that have been around for a while since you stopped producing more. Okay. So those are the two main things that I want to talk about. Again, you could have a neutrophilia or a neutropenia. So we have an increase in number of neutrophils or a decrease in number of neutrophils as well. And again, there could be different reasons for those. Okay, so what do they look like? I need to tone down the lights a little bit. This is a typical blood smear. Blood smear. All you're seeing lots of red blood cells. Only one red blood cell on this slide, and that's this one right here. Okay. And if you look at it carefully, you'll notice it has a slight uh, eosinophilic tinge to its cytoplasm, so you can kind of make out where its boundaries are. But you don't really see anything clearly as individual granules very well. Okay. The other thing I want you to notice is that we've got one, two, three lobules here. Okay. So we have a lobulated nucleus. It's nice, nice and round, it's not flat or anything has individual lobules, and they're all interconnected with one another. This is a neutrophil. And if you were to try to measure using one of these red blood cells here, it probably would get about one and a half red blood cells across. Okay? So roughly maybe 12 micrometers in diameter, so it's a little bit more. Okay? Again, you can use your red blood cells as rulers, remember that. Here's another one, I like this one. Because if you look at it carefully, you notice the actual connections between the lobules. There's a little line connecting these two lobules here. It's a little bit of chromatin connecting the two. And there's a very thin line connecting these two lobules as well. And this right there tells me that this particular, um, this particular neutrophil is coming from a female. Okay? So by looking at this slide, I can tell you this is a sample taken from a female. And I know this because this little drumstick right here is that bar body. It's that extra X chromosome that has been compressed and basically put away by that cell. Okay. So again, females have two X chromosomes. They don't need both of them. So they will tend to take one of them and just condense it. And that happens in every cell. And so we have is that condensed body, very tightly packaged little chromosome. That's the X chromosome right there. That's that bar body. So sometimes if you have a really well prepared slide and you have just the right angle on a particular neutrophil, you can actually see that bar body. So you can tell the sex of the individual just by looking at a blood smear. Okay. The next most common granulocyte is the eosinophil. Uh, as the name suggests, it is highly eosinophilic. It tends to take up a lot of eosin. Um, they, again, this is not a very common cell, but 1 to 4% of leukocytes in the blood smear are going to be eosinophils. About the same size as a neutrophil in terms of diameter. Okay. Again, it is a phagocytic cell, so it will have some lysosomes. And so sometimes it does have these neutrophilic granules, but because the eosinophilic granules within its cytoplasm are just so intense, we usually don't really detect the lysosomes. Now, this cell is responsible for phagocytizing antigen antibody complexes. 
Uh, it also is upregulated during parasitic infections. So if you have a parasitic infection, you're going to see eosinophilia, which means an increase in number of eosinophils. Okay. So if you're seeing an increased number of eosinophils, you know you're looking at an individual who has a parasitic infection because these cells are upregulated for a reason. Now, it has a bilobed nucleus, unlike neutrophils, they usually just have two lobules. You might have an extra one, sometimes there's three lobules, but usually it's just a bilobed nucleus. You guys have already seen a lot of eosinophils. If you go back to your slide boxes this week, take a look at your mucoid tissue slide. That's why you guys were looking for plasma cells, but if you look around, you'll also see a lot of eosinophils in that slide as well. So by all means, feel free to look at those slides again. So, um, these um, cells have lots of these very intensely eosinophilic granules. And these granules contain <coughs> things like major basic protein, or NBP. Um, it's called major basic protein probably because it's majorly basic, which is why it picks up a lot of acidic dye and all of these. Major basic protein is actually a, a toxic molecule. Okay? And so, we'll tend to um, really harm parasites. Okay? So uh, here we're not talking about bacteria, we're talking about actual, actual eukaryotic organisms that will be parasitizing the body. And so what we have is major basic protein, which is toxic to a lot of these animals, uh, but also tends to be somewhat toxic to your own cells as well. So again, if you see some release of this material, into the tissues, which does happen from time to time, is going to irritate a lot of your tissues as well. Um, you have things like eosin peroxidase. So again, a molecule that's capable of producing reactive oxygen species. Again, that will be used to damage membranes of whatever target it, it has. Uh, in the cynophil cation protein, again, another neurotoxin type of uh, protein. Uh, again, specifically directed at parasites. So it has a very toxic effect on protozoa and especially. Uh, and neurotoxin, uh, cynophil derived neurotoxin, it says right there, it's a neurotoxin. So again, uh, very much effective against parasites. Okay. Um, it also does have, as I mentioned, some azure fluid granules, which would be the um, lysosomes. But again, they're not usually visible to the microscope because of just the abundance of these uh, eosinophilic granules. It also produces histaminase and aerosolvitase. Uh, histaminase is an enzyme. What do you think it breaks down? It's the mean. Okay. So chances are eosinophils will probably be also involved in what kind of reactions? <coughs> Allergic reactions. So if your mast cells are degranulating, releasing lots of histamine and lipotrienes, these enzymes here, this one will be acting on histamine, this one will be acting on the uh, lipotrienes. So they will be breaking those down. So it helps to control allergic reactions as well. So it will help to modulate the activity or the, the actual response itself. Now, eosinophils are very active during inflammatory response. Okay. So inflammation, if you have inflammation, chances are eosinophils are going to be involved in that somehow, especially in propagating. How many of you have ever listened to the radio, watched TV, and, and heard that some baseball player just got a cortisone shot um, to help them play, keep playing. Um, that's basically a cortisone steroids that they just were given. Okay? Now, eosinophil activity and production is going to be inhibited by the presence of cortisone steroids. Okay? So whenever they're getting that cortisone shot, they're actually trying to bring down inflammation. Okay? So that's what's going to be happening there, is basically if you have cortisone steroids pre present, is going to um, slow down and inhibit inflammatory response. 
which as hopefully we'll get to see today, is not always something you want to slow down. It actually can be a very beneficial thing. So, if we're to take a look at this slide, what you'll notice is we get lots of red blood cells. But also we have some white blood cells in here. How do we have white blood cells? They have nuclei. Okay. So here's one white blood cell, here's another one, here's another one. The three I just outlined are lymphocytes. How do I know this? Because it looks just like a nucleus, and that's all you see. Okay. Lymphocytes tend to just be the size of the nucleus with a very tiny amount of cytoplasm around it. So usually whenever you're looking at a lymphocyte, you usually just see the nucleus and not much else. This cell on the other hand, you can see is relatively large. Again, try to measure that with some of the red, uh, red blood cells on this slide. It's probably about two red blood cells across, so probably about 14 to 15 micrometers, maybe 16. Okay? And notice again, we've got two lobules of the nucleus, we've got this basal fluid regions right here, and the rest of it is just filled with this eosinophilic material. Okay? This is an eosinophil. By the way, um, these red blood cells that you're seeing here, they're kind of these long chains or ro uh, rolls. Um, these are sometimes referred to as rouleau. It is normal to see some of those on a typical slide. If you're seeing a lot of rouleau, it could be an indication of increased viscosity in your bloodstream, which could mean what? If your blood is more viscous, what does that usually tell you? Too many red blood cells. Okay. So, this is something that, again, Rouleau do happen periodically just because red blood cells are somewhat sticky and they tend to stick together once in a while. But most of the time you will see them <coughs> as separate entities. If you see a lot of Rouleau on a slide, it could be an indication of increased viscosity, increased stickiness of these red blood cells. Now, that depends on where you're looking as well. Okay? Depending on which part of the slide you're looking at, you will see slightly different things. If you're looking at the center, or near the center of the actual blood smear, you will see nice and separated red blood cells, as I showed you in one of the earlier slides. And if you're looking around the edges, where these things dry out a lot more, they will tend to form this sort of thing as well. So if you're looking around the edges of a blood smear and you're seeing this, it's probably fine. If you're looking at the center of a blood smear and you're seeing a lot of this, it could be an indication of abnormality. It could be an indication of these rouleaux being normally present within the bloodstream. Okay, the next, neutral, the next um, granulocyte is the basophil. Now, these are the least common before the bond. Rouleau is that chain of red blood cells stuck to one another. Okay. So basically, what we have is a red blood cell attached to a red blood cell, attached to a red blood cell, and so on. And so on. We have this long chain of red blood cells stuck together. That's how we know. It's basically a rule. So basophils are the least common leukocyte in the bloodstream. Okay. Please, please, please do not ask your TA to find you one. They will be sitting there for the whole lab trying to find one lousy cell. It is very uncommon. Remember, on your slides, only about 1% of the cells you'll be looking at are white blood cells. And of those white blood cells, Less than, less than 1% of those are basophils. So they're literally looking for a needle in a haystack. If you find one, good for you. Show it to everybody else. But do not ask your TA to find one for you. In fact, I spent hours trying to scan us like back and forth, little grid pattern, search pattern for myself. I couldn't find one in the spot because it, they're very rare. Okay? So again, chances are if you see an increase, Basophils, like basophilia, that might be a bad thing. And it usually is. In fact, chances are if you're seeing lots of basophils on a blood smear, chances are the patient you took that blood from is dead. Or is now dead. Okay. 
So uh, you're too late. Okay. Uh, so usually, an increase in basal fills is a very, very bad thing. Okay. They are very uncommon, uh, but they are very similar to mast cells in many respects. Okay. So again, in terms of their actual appearance, um, again, about the same side as neutrophil or uh, uh, eosinophil. They have lots of basophilic granules and basophilic nucleus, so it kind of is difficult to really see that nucleus in many cases. Okay. Uh, the granules tend to appear very large, so be on the lookout for that. In fact, they might make the, um, the boundaries of the, of the cell look a little lumpy because of just how large they are. So that would, would be one of the things you might want to look for. Now, again, the nucleus here is bilobed, so similar to any eosinophil in that way. Again, they have cell surface receptors for immunoglobulin E, which is why they are so similar to mast cells in many respects. They tend to function in the same way as mast cells in terms of if you cross-link those antibodies against an antigen, you're going to have these cells activated. And when they are activated, they will release things like heparin sulfate and histamine. Okay, heparin sulfate is a very similar molecule to heparin. Okay? So again, for a long time, people thought that basal fills basically migrated into the tissues and became mast cells. Uh, but we have since found out that basal fills and mast cells actually have different precursors in the bone marrow. So they are actually not the same cell. They are two different cells that have very similar functions. And so basal fill, as with a mast cell, chances are will be very much involved in an allergic reaction. Now here's the thing, a mast cell when it degranulates, it's found within one particular region of the tissue, and so it's going to affect that one tissue in that one region. If you have all of your basal fills in the bloodstream degranulating, they all get activated, the whole your bloodstream basically is the effect of what's going to happen there. Well, remember what heparin does? Remember what histamine does? <clears throat> So we're going to have vasodilation, right, throughout your whole body. What's that going to do? If all your blood vessels suddenly open up, what's going to happen? Blood pressure. Blood pressure is just going to drop. And what do we call that? It's called anaphylactic shock when that happens. It's a very, very dangerous thing to, to have all of a sudden your blood pressure dropping all over your body. It can very easily be very fatal. So it's a very serious thing. Which is probably again, one of the reasons that you probably don't want to have too many basal fills in your bloodstream. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, they are a little difficult to find. So, I had to go online to find some pictures for you guys for this one. So, credit where credit is due. This person right here was patient enough to find one for us. And so you can kind of make out the two lobules here. The nucleus is a slightly different shade of blue than the granules. And you can see very clearly the granules here again. They're quite large. Okay, a granulocytes. Talk about eight granulocytes now. Uh, the first one on the list is the monocyte. The monocyte is not very common. About two to eight percent of leukocytes. Again, these percentages, by the way, will vary depending on which book you'll go to. But again, the comparison of which one is the most common versus the less common and the least common is going to be the same in all sources you go to. It's just the percentages might vary a little bit from source to source. Okay? But the order in which they occur. Um, relative to one another is going to be the same whichever source you go to. Um, now these cells do not stay in the bloodstream for very long. Um, these are monocytes. Um, these are part of that mononuclear phagocytic system that I've mentioned a few times now. These are cells that are actually going to enter the connective tissues and once they're they will differentiate into cells like macrophages. But they are um, in the bloodstream one of the largest white blood cells you're going to see. And they're fairly uh, easily identifiable. So, if you're looking at monocytes, again, because they differentiate into things that are highly phagocytic, the cells themselves are very highly phagocytic. But because these cells are going to be differentiating into other things, 
they can't exactly compact away all their chromatins. So they're actually going to have a fairly large and fairly pale staining nucleus because they require all their chromatin to be available depending on what their final, um, their final form will be. So they will quite often have a very large nucleus, slightly indented, kidney-shaped, or sometimes referred to as a horseshoe-shaped nucleus. And it's going to be a fairly pale nucleus, so large, pale, kidney-shaped. So there's going to be an indentation in that nucleus. Again, remember you're looking at three-dimensional cells in two dimensions on your spot, on your smears. So this indentation may not always be very clearly visible. That might be because that little indentation is facing you at the time. So keep that in mind. Not every single one of them will look exactly like this. Okay? Now that indentation tends to be where we have other organelles. So you're going to have the Golgi apparatus and other things in here which are not usually going to be visible. So. Okay. But again, that indentation is there to allow that little bit of space there. The cytoplasm is fairly commonly somewhat basophilic. Okay. So the cytoplasm around that nucleus can be somewhat basophilic, and that's because of the presence of ribosomes. Again, they are the largest lymphocytes, so about 18 micrometers in diameter or so is roughly what we're looking at. Um, and again, it is ibacidic, so it's going to have hydrolytic enzymes. It's going to have lysosomes there as well. So in some cases, you might see a little bit of granularity to that cytoplasm just because you do have these things there. But again, initially, they were classified as agranulocytes. If you look at the slide, again, this one is this room is not really ideal for this, but you can see, again, lots of red blood cells. Here is a lymphocyte, nice brown nucleus. Here's a neutrophil, again, the one, two, three lobules here, a slightly eosinophilic looking cytoplasm. And then this cell right here is a monocyte. I'm going to turn out the lights, just so we can hopefully see a little bit better. And as we look at this room, the lights never really turn out completely. So, the nucleus, is this kidney bean shaped structure right here. There's a bit of a dent indentation right there. Okay, so this is the nucleus. Down here is the cytoplasm. Okay, again, you can see that it's slightly basal fillet. Okay, just a little bit lighter staining than the rest of the nucleus, or the rest of the cell, really. Okay, so um, it is basal fillet. Again, you'll have plenty of opportunities to look at more of these things on your own slides, so you will get a better idea of what they look like. Yeah. Does the presence of the Golgi in the near indentation get like a false Golgi? It, it can, it is possible, although again, there's a variety of other organelles in there as well, and most of them are relatively small, they're not really very well developed at this point yet, because the cell really hasn't differentiated into anything specific. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Okay, lymphocytes are the next ones on the list. And lymphocytes are about the same size as a red blood cell. Now, these are the second most common uh, white blood cell in the bloodstream, and the most common white blood cell in lymphatic tissues. But in the bloodstream, they are the second most common cell type. Now, they can be subdivided into B and T lymphocytes. Uh, majority will be T lymphocytes, so about 90% or so. Let me just double check that number. Yeah, so about 90% of them will be T lymphocytes, about 5% will be D lymphocytes, which leaves 5%. It gets more complicated. But part of that, that remaining 5% is going to be natural killer cells, which are a specialized type of lymphocyte that you're going to attack and not worry about too much of what's going on. Okay. Now, these are fairly commonly found outside the bloodstream and they are capable of recirculating. Okay. So, uh, once they enter connective tissues, they can re-enter, usually the lymphatic system, the lymphatic vessels, and then recirculate again and enter the bloodstream <coughs> again. Okay. So, um, 
these are commonly found outside and they can get back into the bloodstream if they need to, to be transported elsewhere. Okay. Now these cells can be very active during viral infections. So usually if it's a bacterial infection, we will see an increase in neutrophils. If we're looking at a viral infection, we will quite commonly see an increase in the production of lymphocytes. So the number of lymphocytes will increase. Also, as lymphocytes become activated, they increase in size. Now what I mean by that is that the cytoplasm of the lymphocyte will expand. Under normal conditions, when the cell is inactive, the cell is about the same size as the nucleus, because all you have is just a big round nucleus, which is about the same size as a red blood cell, and then just a little bit of tiny amount of cytoplasm around that. When the cell becomes activated, the amount of cytoplasm increases because that cell needs a variety of different things within the cytoplasm in order to perform its function. And so the amount of cytoplasm will increase, and so the size of the cell increases, the size of the nucleus stays the same. So here's an example of a small lymphocyte. So again, lots of red blood cells all around, and then a small lymphocyte right here. Now, quick thing, if you're a pathologist and you're looking at this slide, you might start to think, okay, something's going on here. We've got these little tiny dots within red blood cells. Red blood cells can be infected, and you can actually see the infection. There's some pathogens that can actually be visualized just by looking at this thing in the red blood cells. You can actually see little tiny things inside them. Uh, in this case, this is not an infected individual. These are just air bubbles that are in the way. Okay. But again, if you're a pathologist, you prepare the slide properly, you know how to do it, you do it properly, you focus the microscope properly. You can tell whether one of these bubbles is inside the cell or if it's just an air bubble somewhere on top of the cell. Okay. So you could be looking for stuff like that as well to see. Is there a pathogen within one of these red blood cells that I can actually see? And you can actually, so you can actually get a lot of information out of a blood, a blood smear. So here's your lymphocyte. You can see there's a small indentation right here in the nucleus. And there's a little bit of cytoplasm visible just around this area here. Okay? So that's a small lymphocyte. There's just a small amount of cytoplasm visible. And again, there's that little indentation in that nucleus just to provide a little bit of room for all the other organelles that are present there. If we take a look at this slide, again, we can see lots of red blood cells. And you can see a lymphocyte here. Nucleus, again, about the same size as a red blood cell. Well, we can see a little bit more cytoplasm around this over here. There's a bit more. Again, when you start to classify them as medium, I don't know. I'm not going to ask you. It's a small medium lymphocyte. Uh, but I think this one's fairly obvious. Again, lots of red blood cells, and then we have a nucleus, and then all of this here is the cytoplasm of this lymphocyte. Okay? This is very clearly a fairly large amount of cytoplasm. This will be a large lymphocyte. Okay. Why would it need to do this? Well, think about this. A B lymphocyte might start up like this, but then if it gets activated, it needs to start producing antibodies. What does it need to make? Lots of rough ER. So it's going to make lots of room for itself and to make that rough ER and start filling that space with rough ER. Okay. To become a plasma cell. Okay, last one on the list is the platelet. Uh, about 15 minutes or so to cover information, which is a challenge in itself. Okay, so platelets. Uh, these are not cells. These are, in fact, fragments of cells. So there are cells in your bone marrow called megakaryocytes. These are very, very large, multinucleated cells. I would encourage you guys to take a look at your slides of bones. Look at the bone marrow. And within that bone marrow, chances are you will notice uh, a few of these very large cells. They're going to be extremely large compared to everything else around them. In that bone marrow, you quite often will just see a whole bunch of little tiny dots, very basic little dots, a lot of nuclei. Whereas megakaryocytes are actually multinucleated cells, they will have multiple nuclei within them, and a fairly large amount of cytoplasm around those nuclei. And so it is that cytoplasm that pinches off and produces the platelets themselves. Now, the platelets are relatively small. They're about 3 micrometers or so in diameter. Uh, I think 3 to 5 micrometers. I don't think I wrote that for myself either. So, 
relatively small, but it can be visible as these purple spots under light microscopy slides. Now, there are two major areas, although you won't really see them under the light microscope, under the electron microscope, what you tend to see is that a platelet has an outer region and an inner region. That inner region is going to be filled with granules. This is the granulomere or the chromomere. This is the part that actually stains. This is the granulomere. And this is the hylomere. Because it's glassy, it's very clear. Okay. The hylomere tends to contain a lot of cytos cytoskeletal proteins and things like actin and myosin. Now, why would platelets need actin and myosin? Where have we seen actin and myosin? In muscle. Right? So why would a platelet need some sort of contractile machinery? Well, what happens when your clot has been around for a while? It starts to retract. And that's where basically when these things get activated, they start to retract and pull and so that the clot gets away from the tissue, eventually falls off. Unless, of course, you're like me and you scrape it off until it comes off all the time. And you have another clot forming and you scrape that one off eventually. Uh, but eventually your tissues heal. Okay? Uh, but again, the reason you can start to peel it off and scrape at it is because the edges start to come up away from the tissue. That's because of that contraction eventually. That contraction occurs after a while once that clot starts to have done its function, have been performed most of its function. Okay? So this high linear is where you would have these. Uh, proteins that would be responsible for that contraction occurring. Whereas the granulomere contains granules. Okay? And these granules, there are several different types, which are listed here, dense core granules, alpha granules, and lambda granules. I'm not going to make you memorize what's in each one of them individually. Suffice to say that some of them contain things like ADP. ADP is the molecule that's left over after you're done hydrolyzing ATP. And AD, ADP actually is very important for activating the platelets and starting the coagulation cascade. Okay. So that would be one of the things that will be released. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, wait a second. Doesn't that platelet have to be already activated in order to release ADP? Yes. Okay. But basically what's happening at that point is you're just intensifying the reaction and getting more platelets involved. Okay. So once you release the contents of one platelet, granules, it will tend to release more and more, more and activate more and more platelets as well. Which is why, again, having that initial bit of damage under a vas on a vascular endothelium might attract a couple of uh, platelets. Once they get activated, they will start the whole clotting cascade going. Okay? So you will start to get a bigger and bigger clot. So ADP would be one of the things that would be listed in one of these granules. Um, there will also be things like serotonin. Okay? Serotonin is a vasoconstrictor. Very powerful vasoconstrictor. Okay, so what's going to happen is that if you're trying to stop the flow of blood through a blood vessel, you want to constrict that blood vessel. Well, serotonin is going to do that for you. Okay? But at the same time, you don't want serotonin to be the only molecule in play. So you will also have vasodilators present as well. So that helps to control how much of that constriction happens and also how long that constriction actually occurs for. So again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but let's just keep it as simple as possible. Okay. Um, Platelet-derived growth factor would be another thing that would be present. It's not an important thing. It's a growth factor. So it's going to attract uh, other cells into the area to help heal whatever has happened. Okay. So again, that blood clot initially is going to stop bleeding, but also will start the process of healing as well. So that's why we have uh, some of these growth factors in it as well. So, here's a megakaryocyte, here's another one, this is in the bone marrow. You can see some red blood cells here, chances are that's one of those uh, sinusoidal capillaries that's taking blood away from the bone marrow. Uh, here's a slide of red blood cells, and these right here are platelets. All these are platelets, there's like five or six of them on there. Here's a slide comparing the sizes. This is a scanning electron micrograph. I'm not going to test you on this one. You have to know the others, but you don't have to know this one. Here's a red blood cell. 
platelet and a lymphocyte side by side. So let's get into the fun stuff, inflammation. Now, the inflammatory response has three phases. It has initiation phase, where it recognizes that something's going on, recognizes damage, uh, amplification, so it basically goes into the area and performs its function, and then a termination, basically a resolution. Something basically happens, uh, their job is that the cells is done, much inflammation is no longer required, and so you can move on and heal. Okay, so there's a termination stage as well. Basically, the purpose is to contain the pathogen and to eliminate it. To contain the, the damage and eliminate it. Okay. So, how does your body do this? And by the way, um, basically where you're getting in the next five to ten minutes is a crash course in one third of pathology. Because, um, according to some sources at least, inflammation is one third of pathology. Okay, so if you understand inflammation, you understand one third of pathology. So, Okay. Okay, if you understand this, you're good. Okay? So, first of all, what we have is a reaction of the microcirculation. So we have the capillaries, especially in the venules, the post-capillary venules will be very much involved in this process. Okay. Why? Well, again, these are the ones that have very, very few things in between the bloodstream and the outside tissues. There is no tunica media there. There is no tunica dentition. All you have is that endothelium, and that's it. Okay? So this is going to be where a lot of this stuff will be happening. Uh, so what we're looking at is a lot of movement of fluid and leukocytes from the bloodstream into the extravascular spaces, or into the affected areas. Okay? So there's going to be a lot of fluid moving into the areas, and also a lot of these leukocytes going in there as well. Okay? Again, it's a protective response, so you do want this to happen. And in some cases, it becomes a pathological response, but that's not really what we're going to be talking about. What we're going to be talking about today is just the um, type of inflammation, this acute inflammation, that really doesn't last for very long and just responds very quickly to some new threat, and then there's a resolution at the end of that. Chronic inflammation is a little bit different. This is where we have uh, an inflammatory response begin, but it can never really complete, and so it continues on. And eventually the cells change that are within this type of area. So initially it was characterized by the presence of neutrophils, because that's the first cell type to get into the area of any kind of damage. But eventually those neutrophils will become replaced by things like macrophages. And there's a very simple reason why that is. You don't have a lot of monocytes in your bloodstream. So in order to build up a large number of macrophages to come into a particular tissue to fight an infection, you need to wait for the bone marrow to make enough of them, for them to, and also for them to get to that area. Whereas you have lots of neutrophils in your bloodstream all the time, so the neutrophils will be the ones to get there first because they are the most numerous, they are the first line of defense, they will at the very least hold off whatever pathogen is there and prevent it from going any further, while your body mounts a secondary defense by bringing up more macrophages into the area. But if that's going to take a little bit of time. So the use of neutrophils is going to buy you that time. And again, that's really what that initial inflammatory response is all about. By, about either destroying whatever's there, or at least in, or at least containing it, holding it in the day until your body can mount a more serious defense using other cell lines. So acute inflammation is characterized by five basic, I guess you could say, symptoms. Uh, five basic things that we notice. If you see these, you know you've got inflammation going. Okay? And these have been known for a very long time, which is why the scripture is here. Uh, the Greeks, ancient Greeks, discovered four of these. And then the Romans added on this one. So, calor, rubor, tumor, and dolor were initially observed by Greek physicians, and they described them as very characteristic things that you notice with an inflammatory response. Uh, and then Roman doctors added on Functiolesa, which means loss of function. Okay, so what's going on? A lot of this has to do with just the flow of blood into an area. If you have a mosquito bite, which is going to be a fairly common thing these days, you get a mosquito bite, what's going to happen? You're going to have a bump on the surface of your skin. That's your 
two more. That's your swelling. And now the bump is going to get red. That's rubor, redness. And it's going to be warm to the touch. The inflamed area is going to be warm. That's going to be calor or heat. Okay? That's because blood is flowing into the area. It's rushing into the area. It's slowing down here and spilling out. Well, not the blood itself, but the water, the liquid, is going to be spilling out into the area, which is why you have a buildup of this stuff, which is why you have this swelling. Now you're going to feel pain for a different reason. Remember those mast cells? Their contents can irritate nerve endings. Yeah, you're going to feel pain because of that. Also, if you just cut yourself, again, same thing happens. That cut is going to cause you some pain, okay? Because you're going to be damaging some nerves and so on. So, uh, again, that's going to be the pain. And again, depending on where that happens, especially with a paper cut in just the wrong spot, you're going to not be able to bend your finger for a while. It's going to hurt when you do. That's the loss of function. Okay? Again, it's all part of this inflammatory response. If you see those, you know you've got inflammation going on. So, for the rest of the summer, you'll be looking at those mosquito bites and oh, I know what's going on. <laughs> That'll be fun, trust me. Okay, so, what's going on? To cause all those things, or at least the first three, what's going on? Well, we have three major components here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver leukocytes into the area very rapidly. Okay? And so your body is going to be trying to do this to the affected area. So again, this is going, that's why you're going to have swelling only in one particular region and not throughout your whole body. At least hopefully not throughout your whole body. Because that would be a problem. So what's going to happen is that the caliber, the, the size, the, the diameter of your blood vessel will change. So there will be a change in the caliber of blood vessels. There will be some structural changes to the endothelium within those blood vessels, especially the capillaries and the postcapillary venules. And you're going to have extra visation of leukocytes. Leukocytes like neutrophils, like monocytes, lymphocytes, they will all be leaving the bloodstream to enter into the tissues. That's extra visation, leaving the vascular system. How does that happen? So, the flow and caliber. If you think about this, if you've got liquid, some sort of fluid flowing through a pipe, what's a quick way to slow it down? Stopped. Constrict the blood vessel. One of the first things that's going to happen is a uh, very transient, transient vasoconstriction, which will just kind of stop things, and then a vasodilation. So once it stops, it just kind of pools in the region because you've got a wider blood vessel all of a sudden. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to slow down the flow of blood and it's going to allow cells to leave the normal flow pattern, which is basically going right down the middle of the tube and they will come into contact with the surface of the endothelium. Okay. So uh, a typical uh, flow of, of blood through the actual vessel is the cells actually will be going right down the middle. They're not usually interacting with the surface of the endothelium. Okay. So when you slow down the flow of blood, these cells can start to margin. They can start to interact with the surface of the endothelium. Now the endothelium is going to have cell surface molecules which will be acting as kind of the sensors or for these white blood cells, so things that they get attached to, and they say, okay, this cell's not affected, this cell's not affected, oh, this one seems to be affected by whatever's going on. So it's going to allow the white blood cells to figure out exactly where they need to go. So you're going to have vasoconstriction initially, and then a vasodilation, which will slow down everything. Uh, nitric oxide is going to be one of the things that's going to be used. It's sometimes also referred to as endothelin. Okay, so often produced by endothelial cells uh, in response to the to an inflammatory response and it will dilate blood vessels and especially black and smooth muscle and uh, arterioles etc to really dilate them up to really uh, open them up a lot more so you have an influx of blood which will cause this calor heat because you have a lot of warm material pooling up in one area and the rubor the redness red blood cells in the air. And again, this laminar flow is what I was talking about. This passage of red blood cells and white blood cells right down the middle of the blood vessels referred to as laminar flow. But again, when you slow everything down, they can exit the laminar flow and come into contact with the surfaces of the endothelium. So they will margin it. Now, vascular permeability is going to be affected 
because you have this opening up of the blood vessels there, uh, uh, becoming wider, the endothelial cells will actually contract away from one another. So, uh, why don't you guys follow along on this slide, and I will try to draw some of this out for you. Okay, so, what you have is endothelial cells. Okay, so, this is my endothelium. I'll draw it sure like this. Remember, endothelial cells are attached to one another by junctional complexes, right? Which junctional complexes are we talking about? Zonula occludens and zonula adherens, at the very least, okay? So, they're kind of sealed together, okay? Now, what's going to happen is that endothelial cells contract. So they kind of pull away from one another, so instead of having fairly decent contact with one another along their edges, they will actually contract away from one another so that these junctional complexes are exposed. So they kind of pull away. They will also reorganize their junctional complexes. So they actually will actively degrade some of those uh, junctional complexes within the zonal occludens, which again is kind of like that ziplock seal. Okay? So once you start to break down the zonal occludens, all of a sudden you don't have that tight sort of integration, and so there's a hole in between these cells. Okay? A hole that would allow a white blood cell to stop here and basically push its way through in between the cells. Okay? So this would be a white blood cell. So, for example, it could be a neutrophil. You know, it's a neutrophil because it has a lobulated nucleus. And again, in this case here, you can see how that lobulated nucleus would really help it along. It would really help it to pass through these very tight spaces between the cells. So, reorganization of junction complexes. Sometimes you have direct endothelial injury, so a cut. Just direct injury. So obviously, there's going to be a very clear pathway for cells to exit the vascular system there. Okay. Uh, there's also going to be leukocyte dependent endothelial injury. Remember, we taught me talking about frustrated phagocytosis or the release of some of those proteins from, by, uh, by eosinophils. Again, some of those molecules will damage endothelial cells. And again, that's just going to help more white blood cells get into the area. Uh, and also increased transcytosis. Okay. So again, leakage, we're not just talking about white blood cells here, we're talking also about water leaking as well. Right? So you have a breakdown in these junctional complexes, water is going to be able to exit the vascular system as well. You have direct endothelial injury, water is going to be able to leave very easily. You have endothelial uh, injury from leukocytes, again, water will be able to pass through those damaged areas as well. And again, transcytosis means the cells actually more actively transporting things across the endothelium. So not only is all the damage occurring, but endothelial cells will more actively just kind of pump water across that endothelium into the affected tissue. Why do we want more water in the tissue? Anybody remember the structure of ground substance in connective tissues? It's a jungle out there. Right? It's very tightly packed, there's a lot of molecules, a lot of those proteoglycans packed closely together. It's very difficult to pass through that area. Again, one of the reasons for that is to help to localize infections. But once you want your cells to get there, you probably want to clear a path for them all over. So one of the reasons for that is it's going to basically spread all these things apart a little bit. If you have more water, it's going to spread all these molecules apart a little bit more. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to dilute whatever pathogen or toxin is in play as well. Okay? So if there's some sort of a toxin there, it's in relatively high concentrations. You add more water into the region, concentration of that will become more dilute. It's going to affect your own cells a little bit less, but probably will cause less damage to your own cells. Okay? And meanwhile, your cells can get, your uh, immune cells, your white blood cells can get into the area more easily as well. So there's a variety of reasons why you want to have water in the region, why you would want to have swell. Again, it all makes sense if you think about this logically. 
And then you have leukocyte extravasation. So again, you have those neutrophils marginating. So they come out of that laminar flow, they come into contact with the endothelium, they roll along the surface of the endothelium, and then they get across it through some of those pores that are generated by the endothelial cells themselves by just damaging uh, the, uh, the actual uh, junctional complexes. And so they can do all these things. And so this slide here shows its margination, rolling along, adhesion, so it finds an area where that is really affected, gets across, and then uses chemotaxis to find its target. So we use chemotaxis and then thousands and then kills it. And then again, the cell itself dies as well in the process. Right? So here is actually a natural microgram of one of these white blood cells passing across the endothelium. In this case, it does not look like it's a neutrophil. Uh, it is possibly a monocyte just by the size of the nucleus compared to the rest of the cell. Okay? But again, you can see it squeezes through a very tiny space. So you can imagine how much easier it is for a neutrophil to do this. So, I think what I will do is I will let you guys read through this stuff. But I will show you some videos if you want to stick around. The first one is a neutrophil chasing a pathogen by chemotaxis. So here's our neutrophil going around. And here it is a pathogen. And it's just kind of following it along. That's a chemotaxis. That pathogen keeps on shedding molecules that basically tell the cell where to look for it. So you can actually follow it along and eventually catch it where it is. There we go. You're dead. Okay. So that's the one I really wanted to show you. Um, but also the internet is a wonderful tool for geeks. So I will play you the song while you guys are watching out. And you can look it up if you want. And hopefully at this point you'll be able to understand what this song is all about. Oh, I should probably put the... Uh